There is um, also the, uh, the ritual dimension. Uh, Scott Atron is really good on, on this. If you want to uh, hear more about that, you should ask Scott. Uh, ritual tradition, uh, ritual um, uh, strategy brings people together uh, so that they, um, they can watch each other's behavior uh, in, in uh, this communal setting. It's also the case that in ritual, uh, when the story uh, is, uh, is, uh, is sort of uh, relived, the individual can map on his or her individual story to the cosmic story. Okay, I think this is partly what's going on in the Christian uh, mass. In the mass, you have the death and resurrection uh, of the Christ figure, and the individual can map onto that. Uh, everybody here knows what death and resurrection is about. You've had setbacks, you've had losses, you've had to pick up uh, the pieces, dust yourself off and get going again. Uh, you've had to uh, keep on going when things are rough. Uh, that's crucifixion and resurrection. And so when we go through the mass, uh, you can sort of see how that story is, in a way, my story, and ritual helps us uh, to do that. Uh, there is also the uh, aesthetic uh, dimension of religious traditions. I think it's a really interesting story to look at uh, early Christianity. Early Christianity never got itself going until it got its art. Um, and so there has to be some sort of objective way, uh, some sort of tangible stuff that gets out there uh, that can excite the imagination of, uh, of individuals and so that they will take on the story. Uh, then there is the experiential um, strategy. Uh, every religious tradition that I know of uh, recommends that uh, individuals have some sort of religious experience. This makes uh, a religious tradition empirical in a way. I mean, if you have a religious experience, uh, that is a personal, direct validation of the story, um, and it will keep the story alive. It'll keep your head uh, organized around the story. Uh, if you uh, talk to God this morning and you uh, come in and, and hear a demonstration that God doesn't exist, you wouldn't even hear that because you've had this uh, direct experience. And so these, all these strategies are working together to um, not only help articulate the story, the central story, but to revitalize it, to keep it active, to transmit it from brain to brain, to keep ourselves organized around, um, around this story uh, so that, okay, now here comes the sort of political and psychological motives, so that we can achieve personal wholeness, that is personal fulfillment, and social coherence. Now, it's my view that we've got to achieve both of those things at the same time, and that's tough because in a way they compete with each other. Individuals are in competition with society. I mean, everybody wants more from the group than they're entitled to, and the group, uh, for its part, is always demanding more of the individual than the individual has to offer. So um, personal wholeness and social coherence, while they are, they are uh, mutually dependent, they're also uh, in conflict with each other. And so this is difficult to achieve both of those simultaneously. But I think that's one of the things that stories, religious traditions do. They help us to achieve these things simultaneously. And now we come to the biological function. I think that our best chance uh, as a species, okay? Other species have different strategies, but our species, the name of the game in our species is achieve sociality and achieve uh, personality. That is to say, if we can achieve uh, personal wholeness and social coherence simultaneously, we thereby maximize our opportunities for reproductive fitness. So this is what a uh, story uh, does for it. That's the way it's structured and it functions to uh, enhance personal uh, creativity or personal wholeness and social coherence. Now, um, that um, is a sort of picture of the kind of religious tradition that has been inherited um, in the West. I mean, this is, uh, this is very familiar, a dualistic cosmology, right? There is nature and then there is supernature and the morality is always an anthropocentric 
a morality. I'm going to speed by a little bit here uh, and go to this question because here I think uh, here I think we get some glimpse of what is really at stake. Uh, one of the things that that I was thinking about yesterday was was the very uh, sort of obvious to me uh, fact that that uh, that uh, Sam Harris and the Taliban are both scared of the same thing, right? I mean, Sam Harris told us that, hey, we can lose it all, right? I mean, there's this recognition that our life together, our uh, civilized order is a fragile thing, and by God, we could lose it all. Uh, that's a real possibility. Uh, when we're threatened with that, we want to uh, dig in our heels and, and worry about it. Well, anyway, here's a, here's a, uh, a sort of typology of different forms of social organization. Uh, anthropologists uh, sometimes uh, use a simple um, uh, progressive uh, story like this. Uh, originally, of course, our, our species uh, lived in familial bands, small groups. Actually, I don't think in these small groups there was anything uh, resembling an articulate morality. I think what was going on in familial bands was intuitive morality. Um, and nobody had a set of rules. Um, I mean, if you got out of line, you got a bad look, or you got your, um, you, your face slapped, or something like that. I mean, it's sort of like families. Uh, it, when I'm at home with my family, everybody knows what the limits are. Everybody knows what they can and can't do without any articulate morality. It's only when we get uh, to counterintuitively large social groups, right? I mean, at the level of familial bands, I think morality is pretty much ordained by our genetic inheritance. But when we get into tribal alliances, counterintuitively large social groups, then we need an articulate morality. And when we have an articulate morality, we have to have a story that will justify that morality. And so I think that's where religion originated in that complex uh, transition from familial bands to tribal alliances. There we got uh, religion. And as we made transitions to more complicated, larger forms of social organization, uh, we had to retell the story uh, so that we could legitimate um, the instruments of power and the institutions and so on that exist at the higher level. So as we uh, made a transition from tribal alliances, which were pretty much egalitarian, uh, pretty much uh, um, um, sharing equally, when we made the transition from that to chiefdoms, where the chief owns everything uh, and is not egalitarian, the chief sort of hands things out, uh, we had to have a new story that would legitimate the role of the chieftain. Uh, and as we made a transition from chiefdom to nation state, we had to legitimate the bureaucracy on principles uh, of rational principles uh, of collective uh, um, civil life. And so we had to have a new story to go along with the transition to the nation state. Now, here's where I think things are getting really difficult. This is why I think our conversations here are so consequential. Uh, we're stuck, really, uh, with a choice between transcending this insane notion of 182 or 100, 181 sovereign independent nation states. Uh, and we could, in fact, transcend that nation state system uh, to achieve a kind of global federation. Or we could default back uh, to something a little bit less um, uh, perhaps even back to chiefdom. And if we default all the way back, we'll go back to family bands. Um, well, let's see. One of the things I want to say here is that whenever you get into a, uh, one of these transition periods, you see a sort of widespread, almost systematic breakdown of personal wholeness and social coherence. Things get really tough. Uh, and people start looking crazy, and social institutions begin to break down. That's a sort of edge of chaos uh, effect, perhaps. Uh, but we have now um, the possibility of transcending 
this, how far do you think we're going to get into the 21st century if we have 181 sovereign states um, that, uh, uh, that uh, refuse to cooperate um, in any meaningful way at all? Uh, so either we make that transition to a global federation or else we uh, default uh, back. Okay, now I'm going to um, say something about, you can throw me out. No, okay. Not exactly. The time is running out. Right, okay. Um, because we need to Well, get... you want the straight and narrow, Roger. You're going to get it. Uh, here um, is a possibility uh, for a new story that could somehow be consistent with um, uh, a global federation. Okay, now here I'm basically talking about the story that uh, Carolyn Porco uh, and uh, Neil uh, were working on yesterday. That blows me away, that story. I mean, it just knocks me off my pins. I mean, I've been watching Cosmos. I still watch Cosmos, by the way. Uh, our library has to go and get those tapes, and I, it's, it wears well, I have to say. Uh, this is a great story. It's not a story of... Uh, it's not a dualistic cosmology, it's a naturalistic evolutionary cosmology. Um, and uh, it looks to me like uh, there's possibility for a new morality. And I think actually science can help us a lot here because uh, it can inform us about these behavior mediation systems uh, that we have inherited. We know that these behavior mediation systems can be manipulated by symbolic means, okay? So when we get uh, some real uh, pictures from, uh, from Hubble or wherever to show us uh, um, the sort of social or the global um, solidarity that we're capable of, I mean, that moves us. Um, anyway, uh, what we need then is, a, is a, uh, an, the articulation of this new story where we pin together a naturalistic evolutionary cosmology, cosmology with a sustainable um, sort of trans-anthropocentric morality. And then we have to develop the intellectual, institution, ritual, and aesthetic and experiential strategies uh, to help articulate that story, uh, to transmit it from uh, brain to brain, and to uh, celebrate together. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, an exciting prospect. Uh, it's going to look ugly in the short term. Um, I, mean, we, I mean, you've got two big cultures sort of clashing at each other. Um, the whole world seems to be breaking down in terms of its social coherence. Um, and also, individuals are breaking down in terms of their personal wholeness. But there is hope, I think, in, in the long term if we can articulate this, uh, this new story. So I'll just uh, I'll leave it there, and, and I just want to thank... Uh, Neil and uh, Carolyn for uh, for telling that story. All right. Great. Thank you.